welcome back to day two. It's our final day of our third annual Taoist Gate Conference. Taoist medicine and healing, ancient Taoist wisdom, and its influence on modern Chinese medical treatment. We are very excited to bring you four more lectures, uh, four more lectures from well-respected Taoists and healers today. We have Johan Hausen, Greg Casey, Robert Hoffman, and David Wei. All four hail from slightly different lineages and backgrounds, both medical and Taoist, and we'll talk about a spectrum of healing practices, ethics in Qigong, the role of spirit in medicine, the role of mushrooms in medicine and spirituality, and last, depending on where we started, talking about the five hands of Twena acupressure massage. Before we get into the talk, however, Joseph, who is taking a break from teaching summer camp in Poland, since this is a Taoist Gate event, many of you are probably already familiar with Master Joe, a founder of Taoist Gate and Xuanzu Taoist Center in Francistown, New Hampshire. A master of internal martial art, Qigong meditation, divination, and other Taoist ritual arts, it's been a great blessing in my life to have lived in close proximity to his classes for years. For those who are not living close, he now hosts students and teaches workshops to students from all over the world. So, Master Joe, um, why don't you introduce yourself? Hey everyone, welcome to the Taoist conference. I mean, everyone call me Master Joe, but my name is Xuanmin Zhou. Uh, you know, the sign, uh, we are the Taoist Gate, kind of like a center. We have a good noise, good little big. We have a, like a, a, a like the same piece hosting about the Taoist uh, conference. We're, you know, we're all the, uh, um, idea is to share all the people's knowledge yeah uh, so we share with knowledge we hope like some people have that experience uh, share that or knowledge uh, to everyone and the experience are always important uh, like um, I start, uh, study different stuff and uh, I'm, I'm apologies about that this time I'm very busy in Poland uh, this is kind of my schedule later with this up uh, I hope uh, everyone <laughs> can forgive me. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so maybe uh, I'm not really like uh, have a lot of things to talk. If you have uh, any questions, uh, I will be under the conference and we maybe I'm here. We can like a little bit of the talk. So, okay, welcome. Uh, we can, yeah, uh, next speaker, uh, we can start the conference. Awesome. So what do you think of when you think about Taoist literature available in English? For a long time, there are very few authentic source texts of Taoism available in the West. Mostly creative interpretations of the Tao Te Ching or other classics, either done by academics with little experience and practice, or beautifully worded, but perhaps by poets um, rather than practitioners. So I remember growing up, there's this huge gap in authentic source material in English from, for Taoism. And I actually remember this, like I remember looking into uh, being really inspired by the Tao Te Ching, what, where is there, where is there more literature? And it really, it, it felt like that going on, you know, looking off the edge of a cliff, like just, we were looking for something and, and it just wasn't there. And a lot of that was just because it wasn't available in English at the time. Um, and it looked almost made Taoist literature look like a small and obscure genre when the Tao Zhang, the Taoist canon of books is you know, well over a thousand volumes. It's this, this, this huge variety, uh, this huge vast resource of teachings. Johann Hausen, founder of Purple Cloud Press, has made it a mission to bring these missing links for the Western practitioner to light. They're chock full of information, his books. The reader is not only getting a book, but through commentary and the footnotes, they may, at least in my experience, I feel like I'm getting a whole nother background book to be able to understand the book that I'm actually reading. Um, a Chinese medicine doctor and Taoist practitioner himself, Johan spent more than five years cultivating under Li Shufu at Five Immortals Temple in the Wudong Mountains and is part of the 24th generation of complete reality Dragon Gate Taoist lineage. Also facilitating groups for foreign students as a translator, here to give us the foundations of Wudong Qigong healing is Johan Hausen. Hello, everybody. So first of all, I need to thank my teacher, Li Shifu, who was just mentioned by Sam, and also Tao Shifu, his late teacher, the former abbess of Five Immortals Temple, and his other main influential teacher, Luli Hang, who has also passed away. Because without them, I wouldn't be here, and my path 
would have been probably very different, or for sure different, but very mundane. Today's topic um, that I chose was Qigong healing, specifically associated with the Wudang Mountains. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I ended up there because basically I went to the mountain um, when I got an invitation by Lindsay Wei and I knew literally nothing of Taoism. I hadn't read the Tao Te Ching, I hadn't read the Zhuangzi. I had heard the name, but even in the time leading up to going to China again, I could speak a little bit of Chinese. I didn't really read a lot, time didn't permit it. And I actually wanted to just trust and see what happens. I, I think in hindsight, it really paid off. So I went to China and then over the space of a couple of years, I grew into the role of a translator. And that's where Li Shifu started giving me scriptures where it's like, you have to translate these. These are super essential, there's no translation. And this is really how my life's work has been carved out, which I've been churning along for many years now. And it, it seems to get a little less, there's slightly light at the end of the tunnel, but it's, it's huge. And partially because what Sam also just mentioned is, is the footnotes, like a footnote can take me two hours. And these footnotes are born a lot of times from an editor who just doesn't let me get away with anything. He questions everything. So I can go into a, a rabbit hole and be like, you can write a book about this. Um, it's uh, So it really just blew up with them footnotes or endnotes. So I, I want to say a few words about Qigong healing straight up. So I will not um, teach people how to do Qigong healing. That's not possible in a, in a time frame, And it's also not possible online. This has to do with there's some um, aspects associated with it that revolve around ethics and morality. So I wanna focus on the very foundation of Qigong healing, which means like, where are your thoughts in essence? And currently the, the Qigong healing I learned is taught at the temple. Um, the first time I learned it, we were a small group of four or five people. So it felt, it felt very, very familiar. And so people by living in a temple, they were constantly tested by my master. And this is really, what I took away from it that you have to test your students because with Qigong healing, even though it's for healing and you could, you could possibly argue it's good for everyone to know, there's always a flip side. So people who have very strong powers that can use it for the good or the bad. And I wanna use the example of money where you can have a lot of money, but what you do with your money, like money itself, the object isn't bad or good. So you can donate a lot, for example, to the Hawaiian cause now, or you can buy a lot of terrible weapons with it and the object hasn't changed which is money it's just what you do with it and so is healing and the healing associated arts and dows and viewed like juyo ritual healing that you can do a lot of damage um my teacher alicia for would use the example if you give someone with a lot of powers a button to just have all the a-bombs blow off would you do it or would you give it to a kid that hasn't really learned what is good what is bad you wouldn't. And so that's really what my talk revolves around today. So this is a, a picture actually taken of the Five Mortals um, Temple by a friend of mine. This is one of the exercises. So I just want to summarize the exercises are quite simple. Most of you have probably done them in one form or the other, where you have to do these for a number of days, 100 days, ideally, or at least 49. And this way you store up chi and then later you learn, you learn how to emit it into a patient. And this is one of them, which um, we usually refer to as sun gazing, which is, um, I believe, practiced by a lot of people where you weigh the middle of your palms face the sun. And I found a quote from Master Embracing Simplicity. Therefore, among those who began practicing the Tao in antiquity, there was none who did not simultaneously tend to the medical arts in order to rescue themselves from calamities. So this um, gives us a good idea that Taoism was associated with healing very early on. And that's why my teacher would say that nine out of 10 Taoists do healing. Okay, um, my next topic is the etymolo etymology, of, etymology of Qigong. This is actually a picture of the music teacher of Li Shifu. And this is the character for Qi, the ancient one, the traditional one. So. A lot of times when people try to define terms, they go back to the Shou and Yet, or the discussions of scripts and explanations of characters, which is a later Han dictionary, really. So there we find that Qi is, is cloud Qi. It's an image, or that's its image. And then the second part that I want to talk about, Gong, 
uh, it means it, it says by means of labor stabilized the con country comes from strength and gong so that's separating the gong into its two radicals gong is its phonetic qigong obviously is a as a very modern term so we shouldn't forget that so i usually talk about it in terms of even Taoyin and longevity Taoyin, unfortunately is translated as taoist yoga a lot of times but now it has slowly begun to change into into guiding and leading so when you look at qi there's three characters one is the simplified which is just uh, a couple of decades or not so important then is the the second one which is um interpreted as steam from a bowl of rice then there's the third one that you just that you see on the on the picture which usually is thought to be pre-heaven chi so that's the the chi before you're born and a teacher would generally say if you think of chi as like a magnetic field an energetic field bioelectricity bio waves and bioheat if you wanted to look at it from a scientific point of view and these are all types of formless power and definitions are always tricky but i think we should attempt to define a term that is so important as chi and so the traditional one is Taoist in origin, and it's not used so much anymore. You find sometimes in text both the traditional and the ancient one. And one way to differentiate in them is as pre-heaven and post-heaven. So what you see with the tradition with the ancient one um, on this calligraphy is that you have the character for U, which means nothing at the top. But there's actually uh, there's one stroke missing. And you should explain that as like the like the Tao. You cannot describe it it's indescribable and then the four dots underneath it they have been variously interpreted as fire Li Shifu said this is actually representing water and then he also explained when the sun dries water it rises as steam which is actually similar to the traditional character and represented by the steam rising from the sunlight is the true chi or the gen chi which is so important in cultivation And then we can also talk a little about just I will touch upon it later again is the internal alchemy. So this this calligraphy chi character here is used in internal alchemy a lot, tying in with this notion of pre-heaven. And then it can be described as a chi that is that is the Tao's words for it are very, very because it's indescribable, they use word like it's obscure, it's indistinct, it's even absent-minded for better, for lack of a better word. And this is the type of chi that we want to want to use, that we want to circle, that we want to accumulate. And you want to unify that pre-heaven chi with your post-heaven chi. Post-heaven chi is produced all the time through your intake of food and through your breathing. And then obviously with, with the simplification, both of these characters got corroborated into, into the modern chi character. And then uh, the post heaven chi, just to explain, it really hinges on the spleen and the stomach, who through the absorption of food provide. They say the chi for the whole body. There's even a school which is called the spleen spleen school in Chinese medicine because they say if the spleen is out of whack, nothing else functions. And those of you who've ever had a stomach bug know that when your digestion isn't working, everything is everything is affected. All the other systems, just by definition. For the second type character of qigong. When we look at the, the character, it's sometimes translated as work, which is really strange because it doesn't actually mean work. Um, even if you look at any dictionary, it actually means skill. But what happens is the character for work that's in it, it's a connection between, between the humans and earth and, and heavens, if you want, because it's, it's two horizontal lines with a vertical in the middle. So it represents some, some sort of, of unification of humans with up above and below as well. And Nisha will explain it that it needs strength. So there's a very simple equation, which means gong is time and sweat. So you have to put in the time, you have to put in the hard work. And it, it has to be some sweat. You don't have to be pouring sweat, but even in these stances, you don't want to be comfortable because that's a different type of cultivation. That's not for qigong healing. You want to have, you want to be clammy. And that means you need to go a little bit lower to the point where you exert, exert some muscles and it becomes a little bit fatiguing. And then there's a, a, a saying that every day you practice, you get a day of gong. And if you don't practice for one day, you pretty much take three steps backwards. 
So I thought this is actually um, really summarizing what Qigong and its characters mean. And the, this I talked briefly about, and Qigong is a modern term, has really come about in the last couple of decades. Um, if you want to think of Qigong as Darwin, there's obviously the five anamorphologics exercises by Hua To from the second century, the eight brocades ascribed to Zhong Yichen and Lu Dongbing. And I would even consider those two Darwin as a, as a type of Qigong. And then the difference, just to, just to the question usually comes up, what's the difference between longevity on Qigong and that's in Qi. So for longevity, you circulate the Qi within your own body, but for Qigong, it's absorbed, it's gathered, it's stored, and then it's emitted through your patients outwards. And if you wanted to think of a scientific issue, we would use the example that the human body is made of, of water and you can actually, by affecting the water in the patient's body, through your movement of Qi, you affect the entire body. It's actually also called a technique, um, which he calls Qi Qi Cha, which is Qi Qi, which I've seen myself, which I've seen him do in front of me. I'm gonna just quickly recap the story where a student, she came to the temple and she had severe constipation, it was kind of late in the, in the afternoon. She had a bunch of other issues, but this was really the, the biggest because she hadn't gone to the bathroom for a number of days. And we all know that's very bad for the body because you accumulate toxins. And so he took this glass of water and he, he hovered his sword fingers over the water and he gave it to her to drink. And she, she went, I think, around 10 times that night to the bathroom. And I saw, I saw everything that had happened and I, I couldn't believe it myself. This is actually one of the most interesting story that, that happened while I was there in terms of healing. Just, it was water. I took, I got the water myself. I was just, it was literally just um, tap water. So if you look at the benefits of Qigong, I wanna just quickly go through them. So they foster the original Qi, the Yuan Qi, the defensive Qi, so your immune system picks up, then increases your energetic field, prevent diseases. So that can also be just done to stay healthy, boost the immune system, regulates the hormonal balance. So this is a little bit of, of a mix of Chinese med medicine phraseology and modern phraseology, which as a practitioner of Chinese medicine, I myself, you have to rephrase things because if you say, you have a heart imbalance, people are gonna fall off your treatment table because they immediately will think of the, the heart as an organ and they probably think of heart attack. So I think it's it's important to learn a language that patients have access to without going into thousands of years of Chinese history and trying to explain philosophical concepts. And something interesting I found out recently is that the Chinese didn't actually have a word for philosophy. I'm not saying they don't have a philosophy, but they just didn't name it as such. So it's actually a, really it's a Japanese, invention, the word Jishue. And then different types of Qigong that I've just grouped here together is, I'm gonna talk about a few of them. Longevity Qigong, medical Qigong, five animal frolics Qigong, that's really Daoyin Qigong, eight brocades, Tai Chi Qigong, internal alchemy, meridian Qigong, Daoyin, Dagong, which translates as great skill and hard Qigong. So this is probably the, I think that's the oldest or one of the oldest depictions of Darwin exercises. So we are second century BCE. And I think I can, so the, the goal is, is pretty similar. You wanna, the goal is you wanna prolong life. You wanna increase your internal resistance so you don't, you don't get sick and you don't, um, you stay healthy for as long as possible. And this, this longevity ties in with lots of other aspects. So physical movement is just one. There's obviously diet. There's your lifestyle in society. There's where you live, like you're living a boat, which ties in with feng shui. And there's psychological aspects, which are really about your emotions, because there's even a, a person whose um, book I translated was my first book, Wang Feng Yi, who says all diseases can be found stemming from the heart. So he treats everything emotionally. A person comes with back pain. He would literally uh, find out what's wrong in the family, in the family constellations. Is there any anger? Is there any sadness? and just treat people mostly through stories and sometimes eliciting very strong reactions where um, they might get really angry or really sad and then they have a physical reaction. In one case, someone starts vomiting a lot and then he's cured afterwards. And so as a, as a medicine practitioner, even with Taoist medicine, you always wanna ask, 
why is the person sick? Not focus on the sickness, not giving them a label of headache, not categorizing them, why are they sick? And then you have all the different methods. Qigong is just one. I'm not saying that it's the only one or a better one. There's also other things like massage, prick bleeding, cupping, herbs, acupuncture, you name it. And there is no, there is no best method. The method that cures your patient is, the, is definitely the best method. So this is a picture of Zhe Xiaogong, which um, really is why Purple Cloud Press or Purple Cloud Institute has the name purple as well. This is actually done, uh, shot by a friend with his drone, which I'm really thankful because um, we weren't sure whether we, uh, we, he would be stopped. And so what happens in Qigong healing, you're actually contacting also higher powers. So you just, you're not just relying on yourself or relying on a herb. You actually, half of the power comes from you that is cultivated and the other half comes through the lineage. So lineage is very important, at least in my books. And so for people who don't reveal their lineage, um, that always raises um, some question marks, especially if it's some Wang, Master Wang, Master Liu, and you're supposed to know where this person is because these, these names are in the millions in China. And so it really shows your teacher's responsibility for you. So similar back in the day when people were apprenticing with masters, like any sort of trade, they would be able to say who they did train with. And then immediately people would know, oh, what has this person potentially learned? And the person will also be held accountable. So if I'm just saying I'm learned with um. Master Chen in China, I can do I can be doing anything. I can justify anything, dubious or not. This person might exist or not. But if I actually say, in my case, it's Li Shifu, it's five modules temple, you can find the address online, you can fly there tomorrow and talk to him about me. And I would have absolutely no problem and confirm what I'm saying about these things. And I think that's very important. And that's part of being held accountable. So it happens in these Qigong, in the Qigong healing you use hand symbols or hand seals, sometimes called mudras, which is an Indian word, so maybe not, not so good. Incantations, often called mantras, again, an Indian word, and, and rituals. So there is, I would say there's some belief system attached to it. And again, what ties in with the sweat, a lot of meditation, it's about feeling at ease, being in a comfortable position, not too hot, not too cold, loosening your clothes. With this Qigong, it's an unnatural state because you're using force and you, you're actually merging and unifying your intent, your E and your Chi and force. Whereas in longevity Qigong, you find a position that you can hold for very long, an hour or longer, and you're just merging your E and Chi, so there's no force in there. Whereas in Qigong, you always have that extra tension that doesn't feel natural, that feels forced. And the analogy is the same as in the acupuncture world that you have a channel or a river and it just gets stuck the riverbed with silt, mud, rocks, what have you, and you want to clear that up. And in order to do that, you need force. Like in nature, it happens usually with a flood. But if there's no force, there's just more accumulating. You're just not gonna obstruct any anything that's that's in the riverbed. So when you when you think of these rocks and stones and they're a negative impacting your flow of chi, then this force of qigong by clearing it will have the the healing effect that you hope for in theory. And this is something that comes through practice. Like so, some people can be born, born with it, but that's very, very rare. So perseverance is, is a big thing. And um, that also ties in with eating bitter. So this is not happy, joyful process always to get up in the mornings and do these. So it's, it's um, you put in the work and you get the benefits like with a lot of things and a lot of, I think athletes have to go through the same. It's not always motivation and fun. A lot of times they just don't want to go to training and they go and that's why they're capable of things that other people are not. So this is where Alicia Food talks about a toolbox. If you get this tool, what are you going to do with it? And this is this ties in with why there's something that could be perceived as gatekeeping, but it's actually not originally. Um, I felt a little bit like this. Why is it always Man, mané, like within the gate, which means within the lineages. And that's one of the reasons because the teacher has to be sure that you're using it for the right things. And the, and the wrong things could just not necessarily be harming people, but just making a lot, a lot of money, like someone not treating the poor, which would go against ethics. You're just treating according to who can pay the most. And there are stories in the Qigong world where people have done that when they 
when they gained a, a tool overnight and then they just got carried away by by money and monetary assets and there's actually a a sentence which is when the boat rises when the tide rises the boat floats higher which um which shows the attitude you have you need to have like the more you merits you have, the higher your boat will be, which in this in this in these terms is desirable. So let's go. The next one I'm going to talk about is the internal alchemy Qigong. This is actually a painting by Jen King, and the characters are by Josh Painter. And there are four steps to internal alchemy. I'm, I'm just gonna whisk through it because it's not the main topic. And most of you probably have heard of these four steps. So you have refined saliva and transmuted into essence, Lian Jin Hua Jing. Then you have refined essence and transmuted into qi, Lian Jin Hua Qi. And you see already in the brackets, or I'm gonna read out anyways, the, the first step is really your longevity. You wanna transform your saliva into essence. The second one is how far you're Qigong goes. That's when you refine your essence. You try not to lose your essence, transform it into qi that you then can use effectively in treating diseases. The next step, Lian Qi Hua Shan, is refine qi and transmute it into spirit. So these are really steps from the more material into more immaterial stages. And this is where alchemy, internal alchemy, begins. This is really what most people should aim for, like because the, the following steps are incredibly hard and these. Um, there's no point really talking about step four and five if you're not at step three yet, which is Lian Shan Huan Xu, refine the spirit and return to the void. That's when you become an immortal. And the last one, Lian Xu He Dao, refine the void and unify with the Dao. That's become that's when you become one with the Dao. The immortal probably refers to an earth immortal where you live very, very to very, very old age, but you're not living forever. Like they say they, they use this image of living like to the age of the heavens and earth, which means you you don't die. Then the, the last the last qigong type is the yin qigong, the ha qigong. This is a picture of me because at some stage I wasn't too ha qigong. I haven't been in a long time because you need to practice one hour um, slapping trees every day. It's incredibly difficult to um, find the time for it, but there was a time where I was doing that using herbal ointments every day. And I got a small gong um, out of it. It's um, a lot of people are very interested in this um, in the ha qigong. Um, it has to be practiced really carefully because I practiced it a couple of times against wet tree logs, like the tree had just rained, and I got some pretty serious nerve pain that kept me up at night, and I was actually pretty scared by it. And that's just because of the cold and the wetness that it just had entered my channels. And so you need to have someone instructing you who knows what they're doing. And there's one type um, that um, is called light gong, but I also think it's a type of qigong if you look at the definition because it includes intent, qi, and force. And this is um, probably one of the more famous pictures of um, this Tao's balancing on a, on a woven basket. And this is a skill that you have to start when you're very young. So you have these feats where you can jump, jump, jump very high and um, lift very heavy weights and things like that. So they, my teacher said you would have to start at nine years of age. If you start later, your bone structure, your physique is formed to that extent that you cannot have the same impact. And then the only thing you can really strive to become is very good at what we now see in parkour, where people jump from five meters high without injuring themselves. But um, a lot of people even Back in the day, they would drop out. He showed himself that he started way too late, so he never really got very far. And there's other unpleasant branches associated with people who've done light gong, and these are people who've become burglars. So they have these, the Chinese have these very fanciful names. So they're called cat burglars, gentlemen on the beam, flower thieves. And these flower thieves, to really put it bluntly, are, are thieves that um, intruded into other people's homes and, and raped women. The flower stands for women here. And therefore, this has also been guarded a lot. So there's no transmissions to people with the wrong intentions. 
So now we come really to the bulk of what I want to talk about, which is the ethics of healing Qigong. And this is the main character that I want to talk about, which is Chung, Sincerity. And it's also my generation name, interestingly enough. So the 24th, the Longman, the Dragon Gate sects, they have a 200, there's a 200 character poem. So every new generation gets a new character. When, you, when it reaches 200, it starts from the beginning. The 24th is as Chung as you see here. And as this one sentence Li Shu would say very frequently, which is employ sincerity to commune with, he with the heavens and earth. Sounds very simple, um, maybe a little flowery, but really what it means on the flip side is if you don't have sincerity, you will not have that communication. And it also means that you will not have the powers to heal because as I said before, this is about connecting with the higher powers and with the lineage and the masters, so, and the masters, masters, and so on. So what is meant by this sincerity is really your thoughts. It's really your, your thinking. What do you want to do? What, what do you want to do when you have this communication and you have this exchange with the higher wisdoms? And there are some parallels with Christianity. And Lishifu has read the Bible, I think, three or four times. So he actually uses them quite a bit, which I always find interesting. He knows way more about the Bible than I do, even though I'm even baptized. And he says the same as it says the Tao is within you. And the Bible says God is is within you and you have the same powers, you just have to tap into them. And so this is really about using sincerity to practice your goal, to purify it any given times. So that's not just in any specific, specific retreat or for a number of days, this is an ongoing thing that, that cannot be overstressed and it's um, very easily forgotten. And what I started doing is now, because um, sometimes it's very hard to really ascertain another person's background and where they are in their path. If they're very foul with their language, if they insult other people, if they're very unsupportive, then they're really lacking sincerity. And then they haven't really understood a core value. So someone can have even skills, like they're able to create some cheese sensation for maybe an electric shock. But for me, it has become increasingly important, where's their sincerity? And uh, um, I have crossed paths with a few people where I was, I was very surprised and um, disengaged very quickly. And this sincerity is also stressed because the higher powers will always see what you do. It doesn't matter whether um, there's no other person present or whether you just think it inside, it's not, it's not gonna go unnoticed. So this is about constantly getting rid of your old bad ways of thinking, um, emotional attachment, desires, and the other metaphor I wanna put forth from Nishifu is when, when you have one arm grabbing a knife and it doesn't listen, does the other, other arm have enough strength to, to stop it or you gonna cut yourself? What I'm gonna do is wanna do with this topic is I wanna tell three stories because I think the story is a very good way to exemplify it rather than just going over the same point again and again. And this is a story that is found well, the, the, the picture of the king is from the, from the Dunhuang tomb, which is um, fifth century CE. And I'm gonna quickly go through that. This actually came up because my current book is the, the Dragon Gate's Core Methods, which talks an incredible lot about ethics. It's just about ethics and it's tapping into Buddhism and Taoism. And this is actually a story that comes from a Sanskrit epic of ancient India. It's about the kingdom of Sivi, which the author of the book I'm translating, Wang Chung Yue, a Qing Taoist, also called the revitalist of the Dragon Gate, uses as an example. So the story goes that King Sivi came across a dove trying to escape a falcon, and he offered the dove safety. So the falcon agreed to let the dove go on one condition, that he received the same amount of flesh from the king in equal weight to the dove. King Sivi agreed and had the, had the butcher slice, slice flesh from his leg, and it was placed on a scale and weighed against the dove. More and more flesh had to be cut off of King Sivi, and eventually he had to offer up his entire self for the dove's life. And this story ties in a, a, a little bit in mutilation. One can, might say, well, he's given up his life, that's pretty dumb. But we have quite a few of those stories for someone in Buddhism and um, also in Taoism where you give up your own life for someone else's. And I think that's, for me, that's the greatest, greatest act of, of compassion and making yourself 
small and placing yourself in service of others. So again, sincerity. The one thing that I really value about the temple in this respect is that for a lot of people, and I would really think that most people, when after they've grown up, there are very few influences in their lives where someone really tells you you've gone wrong. Um, unless it's a good friend, mostly families that just gloss over or they wouldn't tell you directly. And, and being with a Taoist master who just constantly criticizes has been um, really a blessing in disguise because it, it doesn't necessarily feel good to be criticized for things that you've just never questioned. But in the long run, that's the only way to really forge or smelt yourself, to use the metallurgy metaphors in Taoism. Because you can go to university and, and it doesn't teach you anything about sincerity, it teaches you how to survive in society and, and making a living is a, a big aspect of that. And I have a, a, another quick quote about sincerity. Uh, I haven't really found where it's originally from. Once sincerity penetrates or pervades the mortal realm, all the realized people descend the jade steps. So what that is really saying is, once you reach the high level of sincerity, there's no limits. You, you've become really the realized people who are highly attained people. They come down from the jade steps, which is in the heaven, heavenly realm, and they actually listen to you. So you have, again, that stresses the, the, com the communication that you have with the higher realms. And when you look at the character from sincerity, there's actually two parts. It's it's speaking, and it's the other one is to completing. So you have to do it by unifying your words with your heart mind. It's not just speech that is is included here. It's really your actions, your thought, and thoughts, and your speech. And you must not be afraid of tests, which um, I want to tell which one of the stories is about, because a lot of the times the Taoist masters have been tested to a huge degree to make sure their sincerity is up to a certain standard so that these teachings, whether you want to call them secret or not, can be passed on to them. And this is really important because there will be tests. And this actually applies maybe more to the internal alchemy path, path where the things that you desire the most that will come and haunt you. Demons might come and scare you. There's the famous example of Shakyamuni who was threatened by demons to take his life and he was willing to give it up. He just sat there. And that's that's probably one of the, the major lessons where from Nishifu that whatever happens in meditation is just on a side note don't attach to it don't go away if jesus comes or your late mother or father don't go away with them very important then there's another quote even if the three lads nine maidens lord jesho the nine headed serpent body deity and the 120 celestial officials arrive you must not look at them closely if they question or reprimand you you also must not reply this is again translated by Louis Kamiathi um, that's a forthcoming translation of the Master Embracing Simplicity. And this really um, parallels that. It doesn't matter what happens, don't react to it because bad things can happen. So Lishifu lost one of his students who jumped off a cliff because he saw one of his teachers who told him to follow. And it's, uh, it's very heartbreaking when Lishifu tells the story of, um, of him jumping down the cliff. So again, sincerity, it's all about sincerity. The next story is the story about Guan Yin, who was originally a male deity from India, but then has entered the Taoist pantheon. And I want to tell the story in full because it really exemplifies and epitomizes compassion, sincerity, and really the, the type of mindset you, that you have to have in, in these um, Qigong healing methods. So originally, so the story is really about the princess of Miaoshan, which then was fused with Guan Yin later on. So her father had ascended the throne violently and ruled the land with his queen. And he committed a lot of atrocities and that's why he couldn't give birth. That's why he couldn't have an heir. He couldn't have a son. And he was praying, nothing. He had just, just for the Chinese, you have to have a successor. He had three daughters and the last one was Miaoshan. So there were some auspicious signs when, when the when the queen she was she dreamt that she was swallowing the moon and that's um, and there was also a fragrant fragrance that filled the room when Miao Shan was birthed, 
So the commoners, they considered it a deity. She, was, um, she seemed like to be covered by celestial clouds. But the king only had hope to, hopes to marry her off to then get a, a suitable heir being married into his family and succeed him in the throne. But Miaoshan had no interest. She was just having a simple diet of a bowl of rice, plain clothes, vegetables, and she already behaved like a bodhisattva. And, but the king hadn't given up. He wanted to marry her off, just like he'd done with his two elder sisters. sisters. But Miaoshan made, made it very clear that she wanted to become a nun, and she had no interest in entering the worldly concerns and affairs of, of starting a family. And eventually, she was convinced by her mother to tie the knot to get married um, under three concessions from her father. One of them that he would remove aging, he would remove sickness and remove dying alone from the world. And as her father flew into, he got furious. He was like, these wishes, no one can fulfill them. And got incredibly angry. And so it was proposed to Miaoshan to marry a military person. And she says the only one she was willing to marry was a doctor. And at that time, a doctor didn't really have a high standing. So like for a king to have a prince, it wasn't an option to have a doctor. And there's a, a quote I want to read out from her. She said, my desire to heal the world of all its ills, of the chills of winter and the heat, heats of sickness, I wish to make all equal. Regardless of riches and poverty, I want all things to be shared so no one goes without or has more than they need. If I can marry a man who will help me in this, then I shall marry tomorrow. So the king still couldn't let go of, of her wishes and he decided to make, make her work really hard in the, in the palace and to put on a minimal diet. And her mother saw what she was put under and Princess Miaoshan and finally convinced the, the king to let her become a nun. And even in the, in the nunnery, her life was made very hard by her father, but she was helped because due to her cultivation, she had this communication with the master of heaven and the spirits of the North Star and other earth deities. And so she, her will wasn't broken. The, the king then resorted to just something unbelievable. He burned the entire nunnery down um, had it surrounded by soldiers and lit up on fire. But Miaoshan prayed to the Buddha and it actually picked up raining, rain clouds formed, which extinguished the flames. The king then had totally lost his mind, so he had her captured and she was scheduled for execution the next day. And the master of heaven, so the spirits that she had communicated with, found this out and so he sent a tiger to snatch her away after she, after she has been executed and with a pill of immortality return her back to the living. And there is, um, then eventually the king becomes very sick. And I just wanna, just wanna cut this a little bit short because it, it goes on and on. And a, a Buddhist monk, he said, there is, um, if someone is willing to make an ultimate sacrifice to give an arm and an eye without anger, this could be made into medicine that would cure the king. The king thought it would be impossible for anyone of that heart mind, of that frame of mind to make that sacrifice. And so the monk said on this mount, Mount Xiang, where Miao Shan was after she was rescued by the master of heaven, he would find an immortal Buddhist who was, who was willing to follow that request. So he sent, he sent people there, messengers, and they arrived at the Mount, Mount Chang and Miao Shan, without blinking an eyelid, she gouged out her eyes and her arms and gave it to the messenger. The, the messenger went back, the king took the most potion, took the medicine, recovered immediately and thanked the monk. And the monk just disappeared. No one, no one know where he went. And so this whole family with all their servants, they went to Mount Xiang to express their gratitude. And so when they got there, they rec the king and the queen recognized it was a daughter and they fell to the ground asking for forgiveness. And Miao Shan said to her father that she gave up her arms and eyes out of her love for him. And she said from now on, she doesn't need those mortal eyes and arms because she's got diamond eyes and she has 
golden arms instead of immortal arms. So this is what you see in the in this impressive statue. And then she was lifted up into the heavens on on colorful clouds, and a shrine was erected on the place. So even though I was very familiar with Guan Yin for a long time, I didn't know the story. This is actually in, in Martin Palmer's book. Very, very interesting. He also makes a claim that her iconography might be influenced by the Virgin Mary based on some Silk Road findings. And so Guan Yin is the, she, she's the observer of Christ. She is a Bodhisattva because she heard the cries of, the, of humanity. And so she didn't ascend. Uh, very important in a lot of Tao's temple, there's actually one temple hall dedicated to her, um, built by Lisha for after he had a vision in a dream. And so she's a, a very important figure. Our last story is about Lu Dong Bing. And this um, is fairly short. So basically, his teacher, Zhong Li Quan, he offered Lu Dong Bing a gift. And he said, this gift is you can, it's the gift of turning anything into gold. And so you would be able to provide a lot of riches and, and really take people out of poverty. And Liu Dongbing asked Zhong Yichuan, his teacher, what happens after a number of years? Is there anything I need to know about this method of turning normal objects into gold? So this, it might, it might actually make you think of, the, of King Midas, who, who then got pretty cursed because he couldn't touch anything he wanted to eat because it turned into gold. And Zhong Yichuan said, um, I believe it's 100 years. After 100 years, these objects turn back. And so Liu Dongbing said, I don't want this skill because it doesn't matter who I help with, with this in this life. There will be, a, after 100 years, a person who will lose a lot. They will be devastated. They will end up with their ordinary objects, might be tin, copper, what have you objects. So I cannot do it. I don't, I don't need this skill. I don't want that skill. And that's, that was a test for, it goes on like in two sentences saying like it didn't, it didn't take long. Zhong Yixuan congratulated him and it took, didn't take long before unified with the Tao, became the Tao, which shows his sincerity. He's, he's not only thinking far ahead, he's, it just shows his wisdom. It's one of the, the tests I was, I was speaking about earlier of, um, of um, the masters that that's why it's important to have these transmissions in person where someone can ascertain, are you, are you learning something for the right reasons? Do you have forbearance? Do you have compassion? Because um, these are things you might not take away from your, from your family members and from your friends and um, from people around you. So this is pretty much what I wanted to get through um, today. There's, um, yeah, just, just other things that you should mention is this is, this is this is just um, hard work that you have to put in it. It's not something that happens in a eight star hotel. You cannot say you don't do it because it's raining or you don't do it because you don't feel comfortable. It will not yield the, you will not, you will not harvest the fruit of your labor with an attitude like this. So it's, um, it has this ethics component. It has this hard work component where you really have to put in the time. Um, the sweat that comes from it from low stances, there's no excuse with weather because only when you practice every day, you will get Gong and you're moving towards that eventual goal um, of really having the skill. And this is another picture from the from the top temple again with the sun gazing, which has to be done just about this exercise when the sun is just coming up. Usually when it's a red red ball, as soon as it gets too high, the radiation is too strong, the light is too strong, it will injure your eyes. So if you miss that window, you've missed it. It's um it's that simple. This is at the at the Yushitian, so the top temple that is dedicated to Jenno or the true warrior or the mysterious warrior. And you can open the floor for questions. Thank you, Johan. Um, I really appreciate the this talk. It's, it's really nice to hear. You know, I, I'm sure some people want to hear just the techniques, but it's really nice to hear. Um, kind of the foundation for this Qigong healing method, the gong itself and the, um, as well as the ethics, because I think sometimes there, there are a couple of schools where that's a little maybe placed at the end. And it, and it might be nice to, for some people to see that in your case, placed right at the front, front and center. So as far as questions, 
we usually use the chat box. So please drop any questions that you have in the chat box. We'll start with a couple that we already have. Um, the first question is, what do you, oops, my screen changed a little bit. What do you mean specifically when you refer to accumulating the obscurity? Does that include Gui? Also Gui, Gui as in ghost? We'd have to clarify. Um, if you want to put that in the chat. So um, it's it's, yes. it's true chi really, or original chi, or or pre heaven chi. Um, obscure was more in in terms of um, a way of describing the Tao, which is hard to describe. So they have these words in Chinese, yao yao ming ming, which are incredibly hard um, to translate. Translate, and so I think still they should be translated, but I, I'm struggling like anyone else. Absolutely. So the true, true chi. Uh, could you elaborate also on sincerity regarding what a new age they call the spiritual ego? How does qigong help to be grounded? I, the way, I first want to talk about grounded a little bit. It's um, I, I have been asked a lot of questions about grounding as a translator, and to this day, I still don't know how to say it. So you just say to grow root because the Chinese don't seem to have this grounding. Of course, you could say grounding is yin, but it's uh, incredibly hard to translate. And um, as a term, I, I, I try to avoid, avoid a little bit. Um, I don't think it matters if it's new age or if it's, if it's any, any generation or any time, because that's why the, there's a medical classic, I'm just gonna go back a little bit, which is called the Huang Yin Aging, the Yellow Empress in a classic. And that's some parts at least are from the Han Dynasty. So we're talking 2000 years and you read it and it's so applicable to society. So sincerity, really starts with um, watching your thoughts and you could really just say positive or negative thoughts. There's um, one thing that I think has happened a lot with social media is where um, we tend to comment more negative thoughts or communicate more criticism, whether be it in a, in a constructive or non-constructive way. But how often do we just reach out to someone and be like, hey, I really appreciate you being a good friend or I really appreciate you sharing this. I think we have a tendency where there's this imbalance of negative critiquing, calling out, um, putting someone in place as opposed to just saying some, someone just being um, grateful, expressing your gratitude. So that applies to a new age person as much as to any cultivator or not. Definitely, thank you for that uh, response. Um... Okay. Lisha Fu would also say about this. So if there's a situation, obviously there's a, multitude of situations where you can think of how do I best react? And this might sound a little bit pretentious, but I don't think it is if you really think it through. He said, what would Guan Yin do in your position? What would Jesus do in your, in your position? And that, that opens up a complete different thought pattern. If you like, well, I really just wanted to scream at the person, let it out, I needed to express my anger. And then you think that what would Guan Yin do? It's like, well, certainly not what you just planned on doing. So it, in a lot of situations that it can actually help. And I'm aware that some people need to be probably yelled at in certain situations because um, otherwise it doesn't get through. But for a lot of times I was like, wow, this is actually incredibly humbling to think of what would uh, a highly cultivated being do in that situation. And oftentimes I catch myself, I'm like, definitely not, not what I've done. No, I can relate to that quite a bit. Um, even, even just thinking about what, what I would be proud of five minutes from now <laughs> once the emotion passes oh i don't want to be i don't want to be kicking myself in the in the butt uh maybe i should hold my tongue right here um and i'm certainly even my better self is not a highly realized person so that's something to aspire to uh dia asked if i well heard because the connection is uh not so great today i hear i heard a word metaphorses which is a term i never considered um uh, i think it was just could, I think it was just metaphor. I think it was one of the quotes. So um, okay. that was a pretty bad connection that was misunderstood. Sure. I have a question, uh, if I may. And this is something that came up a lot in Chinese medicine school, because in Qigong, uh, I've heard, you know, different teachers have slightly different opinions. But, you know, obviously, there is this element of sweat. There is this element of like kind of working out toxins. There is this element of obviously building up gong through hard work. Um, but then we also have contrasted with certain seasons really wanting to kind of keep the pores more closed and keep, um, yeah, and, and just like keeping some sort of our, you know, our fluids and our essence uh, 
keeping that from escaping. So I'm wondering if you have any, because you're also a Chinese medicine practitioner, if you have any insight on um, that balance, if it if it matters uh, in your view and how that relates to going through these intense periods of training where, you know, sometimes in, uh, you know, I know the set that you're talking about. So um, I practiced it under Lindsay's tutelage. So you, you go through some of these stances and you're in quite low stances and, and you're sweating quite a bit, you know, uh, especially depending on the time of year. So do you have any insight on that balance? Yeah. So what I think is really important to remember is that we're talking about stages or maybe even labels. So if you want, you're interested in longevity, then you should really follow these advices of in winter, you have to be more inwards, the ties in with diets, with different practices. There's even um, sets where they talk about 72 different, the years divided into 72 different time phases, the Jia Qi. And that's really for an ideal scenario where not much is wrong. So um, that can be applied then to a, a large, a large number of people but if you are you also have to take into account the individual so for me it's just my example i drink green tea all year round and i and i, I do it because i'm hot in nature so it doesn't bother me i can always sleep but i would never advise this to everybody to drink green tea all year round because it's cooling so if you drink a lot of green tea in winter or even for someone with a weak spleen and stomach you probably get stomach aches especially when it's very thick or concentrated so from that point of view the longevity would be like in summer, drink green tea to cool you down. In winter, drink black tea to warm you up. When it comes to Qigong, this is sort of another category outside of it. So this is not dependent on, you can only practice this in spring or in summer. Once you start practicing, that's when your clock starts ticking, regardless of the season, and you will go past one season um, if you do 100 days. And then you have to do it regardless of the weather. It doesn't matter whether it's raining, it's pouring down. If you have 35 degrees, that's that's when you start and you and you go through it. So what do you, it's, it depends on the end goal. What do you want? Do you want to have a healthy body for longevity? If you want to get the chi to do chi gong healing, you have to do the set of chi that you've been taught. Um, so depending on what you want to achieve, you have to tailor your lifestyle towards it. If you want to become a very good sprinter, I wouldn't start swimming. You might get your cardio up, but you need to really run. Like marathon runners, they run. They run more than 40, they run 60 kilometers. and with most of the sports, you just have to do it. So what you want is, is, is what, you, what you do with your life accordingly to get there. I appreciate that answer. I think you touched on it a bit in your lecture, um, an extension of what you just mentioned. When you talk about Qigong, it's not necessarily meant to always flow with nature. We're talking about mm -hmm. creating a, a state where we're accumulating, we're absorbing and emitting as opposed to just living out our, our lifespan. Yeah, and, and then in other practices, you can see these ascetic practices where you're like, well, that's not natural. A lot of times people say Dao, Dao Fat Zero, and the, the Dao follows the natural way. And the things that people do are, are highly, highly unnatural, like sleep deprivation, um, almost boarding, starvation, like these fasting practices. And you'll be like, that's not natural. I just want to be natural. Again, what do you want to achieve? From a longevity point of view, obviously, you need your sleep but there are inter internal alchemy practices or there's even a day where you shouldn't sleep at all because the, the worms are sent to the heavens to report your wrongdoings. That's not natural either to stay up all night. So what are you after? That's always the base question. So I get questions like, I want to learn more about Taoism. I'm like, what do you want to learn? Because it's it's so vast. I can, I, I can hardly give you an answer on like Taoism, that broad category. Yeah, absolutely. Really diverse set of practices. Uh, we have Manny in the chat uh, noting a transition in your life, Johan, from uh, hard Qigong uh, towards what you're doing now. Can you provide guidance on how our practice should change as we get older? I don't think there's an overall statement. I, everyone has to decide that for themselves. I just know that Li Shifu generally would say for martial arts, you turn to softer practices and he would um, be a little bit amused when you saw the 70-year-old um, Daos come up the temple and he would, would be holding these really heavy, heavy metal balls and still do hard qigong. It's like, this guy hasn't moved past that. And I think it's a natural progression from um, any kind of sports where a lot of people, when they're young, they, they try anything, a lot of hard impact. And then maybe later on they go, even if it's just normal sports, it would be like going to biking, to swimming, maybe tai chi qigong if they're interested in the Chinese arts, just because you notice that your body 
you can't just put them through the same regime when when you're really old some people are really lucky they can still play soccer when they're 40 but that's the cutoff like professionally well that's the cutoff point really so i think you you will know yourself when you're ready to slow down a little bit and also the amount of injuries you sustain if you every time injure yourself you you probably overdo it so in this case you can really listen to your body and what it tells you because it does send out messages absolutely thanks for that uh, Rosie is asking, can you elaborate more on different Qigong practices you practice with these schools and contrast those with those which are more popularly practiced in the West? So that um, is problematic because I really started my journey with Li Shifu and so I haven't practiced or um, extensively researched other, other methods um, because it would literally be like taking other people's courses to see what other people have to offer and um, I rather focus on the practices that I do. So we could, so I, I did some hard qigong because I was always interested in that, and I and I choose one for my forms because I've got naturally quite wide forms, so it was sort of chosen. I have very thin fingers, so finger qigong wouldn't have been good for me. Like we had people in there that had really thick fingers, and they could do a, a finger qigong. But apart from that, the same set that is practiced for the qigong healing can also be practiced from a longevity point of view and that's when these parameters change where you just don't go that low where you just trying to be comfortable your, your arms can even be in a slightly different position wherever it feels comfortable to you so do that then i do the healing qigong type i do um i've done the heart qigong and these are the the main three types um that i've done and there's longevity exercises that tie in, into into dao yin which are which looks like which look like moving qigong like your feet move very simple stepping methods and arm movements that um are quite powerful if practiced over a long time awesome yeah thank you for the answer um dia asked you have a specific any specific qigong advice for people with heart issues uh i read a contradict contradicted book about um she read a book that they were suggesting only light qigong in the beginning okay that that really depends because is it, is it the heart from a chinese point of view that could just be heart qi deficiency is it like a, a triple bypass so it's very it's very difficult to make a, a grand statement but generally i don't think it's contraindicated um if you have like certain heart conditions don't allow you to do heart cardio exercise but i don't think it's a problem to stay in a low stance um for that matter um, but again, it really depends on the condition. So I, I would be cautious to say, yeah, go for it, um, regardless of the heart issue. Yeah, that, that brings me to a question um, that I thought of during, from this question is, are there any prerequisites to this kind of, I wouldn't even say hard Qigong to confuse it with hard, you know, hard style, but um, Qigong or any sort of gong where you're building up, uh, you know, you're sweating more, it's a little more physically laborious. Are there any prerequisites before beginning that sort of training that you or Li Shifu would look for? Physically, no, I haven't seen it because the, as you know, the exercises are very, very simple. I think anyone could really, anyone can do them. Like physically, there's, this is not like low squats where some people might not be able to have that flexibilities in their ankles. It's really uh, that the, the I see it like this, you have 90% to get your morality and the ethics right, and then you have the 10%, which probably seem like a walk in the park. But it's just that first step that is so hard, and that also ties in with internal alchemy of, of finding stillness. Like you grind yourself um, for years, decades, 50 years, and then once you are past a certain step, it just it just goes naturally, and it's, it's much easier, and it goes fast. You should use the example of the stones in the ocean, which are at the beginning are very jagged, the rocks, and then over time they become round. And the water is this grinding in society on your morals, on your ethics, on a proper conduct until you become that round pebble. And then and then you're done. The rest is really just easy peasy. Beautiful analogy. Um, if anybody else has any questions, please, you know, kind of drop them in the chat quickly. Okay. Uh, what role from Rosie, what role is does asceticism play in practicing the hard form of qigong? So the hard form is is not hard qigong. Is, is I assume is the qigong healing form. So asceticism is really is really made to put you in the situations where you're uncomfortable, where you show your true colors. So um, 
you could talk about fasting all day until a person has fasted. They probably definitely they will not know what it does to their body, what it feels like. And it's it's an experience that it has to be firsthand. You have to go through it because it's not in the mouth. It's not in your words. Like fasting, for example, I got really angry on day three. I was terrible to be, to be around like people eating, talking about food would drive me crazy. Day four and day five, I felt like a part of the life that to sustain yourself was gone. I felt free in a lot of ways and starting eating again. It made me actually quite um, aware of how much you depend on food intake, like so much revolves around it. Where do I get this food, that food? Do I have enough of this and that? I need to go shopping. Imagine you didn't have to do that. It would not only free up time, it would free up a lot of thought space. So frequently Alicia would say like, if you meditate, what do you think about lunch or dinner? What are you really sitting? You're just sitting on your bum, but it's for nothing. So these asceticisms are, are part of the tests and they're, they're featured very, very highly in Longman and um, complete realization of complete reality. Super important aspect and uh, something very, very interesting. Yeah, absolutely interesting. Um, really fascinating topic that we could probably run a whole, <laughs> a whole <laughs> several, other, uh, several hours. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe even a whole other weekend on.